I got the dog and the dog. Shoot. <laughs> I love this weather. I'm so excited that it's raining. You're fit. What? You're fit. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Right. I know I got to wear my favorite jacket. I'm like, it's cold. My kids this morning were like, it's going to rain. Do we need umbrellas? I'm like, yes. Why not? Right. It actually, actually is going to rain. Whenever it's over 50%, it likely is actually going to happen. Right. Yeah. I'll take it. I'll take it. It's supposed to rain most of today and then a lot tomorrow. Like tomorrow is supposed to rain over like a half an inch, I want to say. Like, so. Yeah. Yeah, 90%. That means, you know, well, at least get a drizzle. <laughs> you know? I love that. They say it'll rain, that we'll get a big storm, and then it'll drizzle for five minutes. So well, hopefully it's a little more than that. But we'll see. So, uh, and then on um, on Wednesday, I want to give you a heads up. We will have class like normal, but I will only be here for the first half hour. We're going to have a guest speaker coming in to talk about STIs, which is a uh, a fun topic always, right, um, to talk about. Uh, Jasmine from our health center is going to come in. Uh, we're doing the psychology interviews on Wednesday, but luckily we were able to coordinate, so we won't need to cancel anything. So I'll be here with her and you for the first like half hour, and then our interviews start at nine. Um, so I'll duck out after that, but she will talk a little bit about STIs. She usually shows lots of very graphic pictures, so you can look forward to that. Uh, it'll make you want to wash your hands. That's all I'll say. Like, just... Her presentation always makes me want to like wash my hands. I don't know why, but I look forward to that or dread that on Thursday. That's chapter, what is that? Chapter 15. So we'll either get through this or close to through this today. And then on Wednesday, uh, move to, to the next chapter, which is STI. So just a little heads up on, on that. Um, and then if you're looking at the syllabus, uh, our second assignment is due uh, two weeks from or a week from Wednesday. So make sure that you are thinking about that second assignment. You're just picking another option from the menu. So uh, not the same ones you did last time, but if you didn't go condom shopping or to like an adult store, feel free to choose one of those this time. Um, or you can do an art project or a book report. We were talking a lot about donors last time. You can be a donor or pick a donor um, if you're interested more in that. Uh, so lots of options for you. Be thinking about that. Uh, and it is due next Wednesday by 11.59 p.m. I made it due before Thanksgiving so that you uh, hopefully can enjoy some of your Thanksgiving time. We don't. So we get uh, Thursday and Friday off. So generous, right? So my children have the whole week off. So I've planned it from day one that I, we won't have class for us that week. So um, I have to be there with them so that they have somebody to watch them. So uh, we won't have class Monday and Wednesday. I have it in the syllabus. I've had it there this whole time. So uh, for us, we won't. And it's it's the worst attended week of the year. There'll be like four people in classes. It's ridiculous. Uh, they gave us the week off for like two years in a row, and then they took it away. So I'm not sure why they did that. Yeah, we get a winter break for sure. It's a few weeks, but we really should get Thanksgiving break. I mean, I need a week to prep for all that eating I'm going to do, right? I, I need the time to do some stretches. So uh, any other like questions or comments or anything? No, it's getting warm. But uh, any questions or anything about the schedule, the plan, any of that stuff? Turkey? I'm just all right, so um, let's get back to where we, we left off then. Uh, we talked a lot last time about how to get pregnant. Uh, now that we are pregnant, we're talking about the development of that baby throughout the process of pregnancy. So uh, just as a quick review, right, we start out as that zygote, that little fertilized cell. The blastocyst somewhere around like day five or so after that cell has divided. That's what implants into the uterine wall. The embryo was up to three months and then the fetus from three months to birth. Latin for offspring or young one. And uh, we were talking about this slide, right? In that first trimester, a lot of divisions, a lot of growth. That's when things tend to go wrong. If they're going to go wrong, the vast majority of the time it would happen. In that first trimester is everything is kind of getting into place and growing. The second trimester is when you typically can um, hear the heart beating for the first time on an ultrasound. Really crazy when there's two of them beating at the same time, right? Uh, twins, there's a lot of heartbeats. 
uh, you can see the sex of a baby on an ultrasound. And by the third trimester, um, it's just kind of finishing, right? Everything is finishing off. The bones start to harden. Um, the skin becomes smooth. Hair starts to grow. The baby's moving a lot. So you can oftentimes see that and feel that very easily. So just an incredible amount of growth over three trimesters, which are those three 13-week periods of time. And uh, most of the like pregnancy books or pregnancy apps or pregnancy um, information kind of talks about fetal growth in terms of food, which I think is just absolutely fantastic personally. Um, but they give you this and I just, uh, I printed or I put this on here because I thought it was kind of a cool connection. Uh, at four weeks, again, you're the size of like a poppy seed, absolutely tiny. And then by the time a baby is born, roughly the size of a watermelon. Right. So just, again, a massive amount of physical growth and change. When we told uh, everybody that we were pregnant, we told our um, in-laws that we were pregnant and they obviously knew we were going through this long journey. We had them over for dinner and we were at eight weeks when we told them. So we put a raspberry on each one of their plates and we're like, let's just see if the, how long it takes them to figure it out. Like we served them dinner with nothing but a raspberry. And they were like, thank you. <laughs> and they were all confused. And then they finally put it together. Um, they ate the raspberries and like, that's morbid. You guys don't eat the raspberries. And then when we had twins, we put two raspberries on the plate, which was kind of funny. Um, so, uh, they go through this whole process and like every week there's certain things that are happening. There's a lot of really cool apps, um, for guiding through this and what the babies should be doing, what the milestones are, um, and then different you know, fruits and vegetables for each, <laughs> for each stage, looking at the size, um, of that baby's development and growth. Every woman has a very different reaction to pregnancy. Pregnancy can go very differently from woman to woman and even pregnancy to pregnancy. Some women make pregnancy look very easy. Others, it is very difficult for them. Uh, very common to have a lot of physical symptoms during pregnancy. Women experience a lot of bodily changes because of all the hormones that are going on. The most prominent one or the one that people talk about the most, uh, morning sickness. And it's kind of a misnomer because it doesn't have to happen in the morning. Typically, this is caused by high levels of estrogen. And so estrogen levels tend to be highest in the morning. So oftentimes people do feel very nauseous and maybe throw up in the mornings. Uh, but this can last all day. Now, this is something that doesn't tend to happen right away. It usually starts about the second trimester. And most women, this is only a matter of weeks, though some might have morning sickness the whole way through and others might not ever have morning. Your mom did? Yeah, she makes work. Like, I did not stop walking. Uh-huh. Work, I'd like go to the side. Like, she just did not stop. Yeah. And then with my brother, like, she had no issues. Isn't that funny? It's so, it can be so different. Same person, different yeah. pregnancies, right? One threw up the whole time and the other one not at all, right? It's just, um, it's all over the place. It's hormones. It can be the baby, uh, I mean, the position of the baby. There's just a million factors, but this can be pretty intense for some women and others, nothing, right? Um, some people don't struggle with this at all. Uh, the partners of people who are pregnant can also experience some of these things. It's really interesting from a psychological standpoint. There's something called Couvad syndrome. Couvad is French for to hatch, right? And so this is somebody who is a partner of a pregnant person who oftentimes might experience some of the symptoms of pregnancy along with their partner. So they might feel some morning sickness, or they might have back or hip pain, or they might have emotions that are out of control. It's not uncommon for a partner of a pregnant person to experience some of these things as well. Um, it's almost like a, an extreme sympathetic reaction, right? So it's really interesting because you see this a lot in partners that they will experience some symptoms of pregnancy um, and they might even like sympathetically eat. I ate alongside my partner because I didn't want to be rude. I mean, she was gaining a lot of weight and I didn't want her to feel bad. So I just ate with her and consider it like, like that. I missed my opportunity to eat for two or three. So I just did it vicariously. Uh, but it's very common for not only the woman who's pregnant, but also their partner to experience. Yeah. Can it stop when you're like it can, uh, it's not usually as prominent because it's a much shorter, you know, um, cycle, but it can, you know, women can obviously become in sync with each other on menstrual cycles. Uh, when men can sometimes experience some of the like hormonal fluctuations as well. This is like a little more extreme, yeah. but you do sometimes see that. 
Yeah. And it's funny if you have like an all female dorm or school or something like that, it's not uncommon for like a bunch of women to sync up and have cycles at the same time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It could be. <laughs> yeah. Kubad. Yeah. Uh, Does that correlate with how, uh, what's it, how well like their relationship is? It could be. Like, if they're like yeah. not as close, it might not be as. Yeah, that's really a fair like assumption. Like if if they're not as close, they're not spending as much time, they're not as in sync with each other, it would probably be much less than if they were um, very in sync with each other. Yeah, for sure. Like that can play a role if they're a little bit distant or or they're not spending a lot of time together. It's not as likely as if they are very like almost enmeshed in a way. Uh, sex during pregnancy. This is something that's actually totally fine all the way until you more. Uh, sometimes people will use sex as a way to try and induce labor, which is a kind of a funny little pickup line, right? You ready to have that baby? Here we go, right? Um, I've heard that used quite a bit. Uh, typically, sex is allowed as long as there are no complications. If a woman has issues with um, the placement of the baby, with the placenta, with a variety of things, um, that might cause complications. Uh, and the doctor might say, I would like you to stay away from any kind of orgasm or intercourse. Uh, but typically, this is something that's completely allowed. It just becomes uncomfortable. Oftentimes, having to modify positions um, as a woman's stomach gets bigger. Um, and because a woman is typically experiencing a lot of uncomfortable physical symptoms, they might not be as interested in sex, right? When they feel a baby moving inside of them and their hormones are out of control, that might curb their sex, like uh, interest in sex a little bit, but it depends on the person. Very common stereotype to say that women in their second trimester are very sexual and interested because of their hormones. That um, isn't always the case. It depends on the person, the pregnancy, and how uncomfortable they are. Again, if they're experiencing a lot of morning sickness and physical symptoms, they might not be as interested um, in intimacy. I have a little clip I want to play for you. Um, really a good movie related to pregnancy. It's based on a book, which is probably the most famous book for pregnancy, uh, What to Expect When Expecting. Uh, and there's a clip in there about physical symptoms, which I think is great. Showing this poor woman, this um, movie follows a couple of different women through their experience of pregnancy. And super common, a lot of women become very emotional sometimes moody, right, um, have a hard time with their emotions. There's a lot of hormones that are coursing through their system. So in addition to feeling physically miserable at times, you might emotionally struggle um, as well. Remember, my partner's toenails fell off. Random thing. Like she lost like four toenails during pregnancy. And I was like, what's happening? Why are your toenails falling off? And like her sister lost hair. Like, I mean, people will have the strangest things happen when these hormones are coursing through your system. You're growing a child for taking all of your nutrients. Also something um, people can have a uh, really interesting cravings. It's not uncommon for people to have cravings during pregnancy. And then sometimes um, the kids will really, uh, once they're born, will really like those foods. It's kind of an interesting correlation. Uh, but oftentimes people will crave random stuff. They will go through all sorts of physical stuff and emotional stuff. It's, a, it's quite a process, right? Of roughly nine months of a lot of these things going on due uh, to hormonal influences. Any um, any comments or thoughts or stories, questions, anything yet? Yeah? Apparently, my mom got obsessed with sandwiches when she was pregnant. Okay. I love pastrami. Oh, you like pastrami sandwiches? Yeah. 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 Isn't that funny? Does anyone else have a, something like that that you? Sure. Every time we saw ranch, she would swallow it, and then she could only eat like she eat lemons. Lemons. Okay. Do you like lemons? They're Okay. They're okay. <laughs> You're like, yeah, they're fun. Yeah. My partner wanted nothing but apple juice. Nothing. I mean, I would have to go to Costco and buy like vats of apple juice. I'd bring it, bring it home and have to go back two days later. It was ridiculous. Just like, you know, the huge things of like treetop apple juice. And my kids, of course, love apple juice, but um, I'm not sure. They probably would have loved it either way. And then in and out she killed in and out for me. The second pregnancy with the twins, she wanted in and out like every day multiple times a day. I like In-N-Out, but not that much. I mean, I, by the end, just the smell of In-N-Out, like, I don't feel good, but I had morning sickness and night sickness because of In-N-Out. Uh, but it's very common for women to have those um, cravings. Sometimes it's even strange stuff. 
right? Like you hear like people having like, I want pickles and peanut butter. Uh, but it's more like you get cases even where sometimes women will crave things like laundry detergent and like bizarre non-food items, which are typically thought to be related to like a, a vitamin or nutrient deficiency, um, which might be happening. So it's interesting that the signals um, that can sometimes come from um, a woman's body and the things that they crave, and they're not always things that they actually should be consuming. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is a thing. Uh, so you can also go on a walk to induce labor. So, you know, if a partner looks at you and says, well, if you want to have that baby, let's have sex, you could also propose a walk. Uh, you know, so I mean, one might be more fun than the other, but still, depending on your. your uh, but yeah, it is. Because what happens is through intercourse, if you cause an orgasm, it causes the uterus to contract. And so by causing the uterus to contract, it could, in theory, if the child was ready already to come out, trigger um, labor to begin. There's also all sorts of teas. There's like a salad someplace in the valley that has the like labor salad. <laughs> Forgetting where, where it is. But it's a place where like if you go there, like the correlation between people having this salad and going into labor is really high to the point where it's been become known as like the labor inducing salad. Um, there's a lot of like kind of a strange beliefs in there. But the idea when you're walking or um, having intercourse or any kind of those things, it, it causes an activity which can help prompt the baby to move down and uh, induce labor. Sure. Yeah. 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 But I mean, again, just as likely uh, to happen from like a walk that it is, you know, so it's hard to say. Yeah. I, I've heard like, if you're like in labor and like, you can be like hand facing your partner, and I guess it helps with pain. You could do. I mean, sorry to make you uh, to make you explain more, but yeah, <laughs> it's okay. You know, I'm yeah. in the right class to talk about it. So, so are you saying perform like like manual sex with a partner, like using yeah. hands? Okay, I I mean the same idea, the same idea of like the, by causing any kind of like orgasm in the uterus. Yeah, I know like somebody in my family's like in the hospital and they were talking about that. Yeah. It helps with the pain and stuff. I mean, it could be a distraction for yeah. sure. But it's most, like, that's a good thing. honestly, most women at that point in like labor are probably not going to be interested in that, but it depends on the person. I mean, some people that might be a welcome distraction, others they might be like, are you kidding me right now? Like, yeah. Of all the times, right? Uh, it really, I think, would depend on the, on the person for sure. Uh, prenatal care, really important to get a lot of prenatal care, right? There are obviously cases of people who don't even know they're pregnant, get no prenatal care and everything turns out fine. And then there are cases of people who get all the prenatal care in the world and things don't turn out okay. Um, so it, it can go either, either way. Uh, so interesting, we were talking last time, right, about um, pregnancy and how it's so much less likely now for the woman to die during pregnancy, right? And then we started watching House of the Dragon, I don't know if anyone's watched that, but the second episode, I was like, oh, we were talking about this in class. I don't want to like ruin anything, but um, again, so much less common for women to run into problems or complications during uh, during birth or to have it be fatal uh, used to be a really big concern. We didn't have as good of medical care, but it's obviously very important to be monitoring the baby throughout pregnancy, to be monitoring the mother. Uh, the placenta is the organ attached to the uterine wall that um, connects to the fetus and gives that baby all of its nutrients, right? So there, anything that the woman puts into their body goes directly to the baby. And that's why there are so many rules about, about what you can and can't have when you're, when you're pregnant, yeah. So it's more of a cultural thing, honestly, more than health benefits, it is a cultural practice. So some cultures believe in saving the placenta. Others believe in, in consuming it, almost like um, like a very circle of life kind of process of uh, kind of consuming that piece. Uh, it's usually just eliminated by the hospital as waste um, unless somebody as part of a cultural belief would like to save it for some reason. Um, it can also be saved for, um, for different like... Uh, like research purposes and also for keeping those cells for later use. Um, so it's becoming more popular to save it, but consuming it is a very cultural thing. There are not very many cultures that do that, but there are a few. I think you were next, yeah? Uh, my mom, she was pregnant with 
the doctor. I was supposed to be meeting one, two weeks before, but like the doctor is there. And then the doctor was like, I have an interview or something. So let's just put you in the right now. Okay. And my mom's placenta was actually in black and diseases. Wow. Well, okay. Yeah. And that can happen at the end. The placenta can, can detach, which can be a huge problem. It can start to deteriorate. There are a lot of issues that can happen with the placenta actually, as, as especially close to, to birth. Um, and that umbilical cord um, can also be a problem sometimes as well. Okay. Um, I'm not sure who was next to you. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Hmm. I mean, if there's, I won't say that there's anything like causal. I mean, it, it may or may not. I mean, there's nothing really like medically to support that, but the power of the mind is very strong. So if someone believes it could help, then it might. Uh, postpartum depression is actually really common. I mean, just a lot of women have it from the hormonal crash. Uh, traditionally, there aren't any medical benefits of consuming the placenta. Like I said, it's just more of a like religious belief for some, um, which is why it's typically just eliminated. But that's, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. Um, I haven't heard that. But I mean, who knows, like a lot of people believe that kind of stuff. So yeah, <laughs> you're like, I'm skeptical. I love that you said that. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a thought too? Yeah. It was of like um, the anatomy teacher was very much like kind of about the placenta. They're saying, oh, well, because unless you uh, don't eat enough in your diet, whatever, you don't need to have your placenta or whatever. My psychology teacher was saying there's a lot of benefits mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. yeah. So that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a common practice. I mean, and it's it's like it's definitely something that turns a lot of people off to think about. Like it's kind of something that I think most people would find a little on the like repulsive side rather than intriguing. But uh, but it depends. I mean, there are a lot of people who will cook and consume the placenta. Make it into like I guess a doctor can make it into like little pills. Mm -hmm. So you can just take it as pills. Do it that way. Yeah, and you can also freeze it as well. Um, there's some research to indicate that maybe the cells in the placenta might be medically beneficial later on in life. Um, and so sometimes that's something that's done as well. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things with the, the placenta. Yeah, or the afterbirth, it's sometimes called once it's eliminated. Yeah. I don't know if that's the thing, but after, like, you can like save stem cells yeah. and then if your child moves in later yeah is it from the placenta? yeah yeah so you would save and freeze like cryogenically freeze the placenta uh and then those cells in there could in theory be helpful later in life um yeah we we are like in the early stages of that kind of stuff but it's something that's growing in popularity so more and more people and couples and families are, are saving and freezing the placenta um in case that is something that could be helpful one day yeah a really well yeah yeah revive one day i i just read something about that how many hundreds of people are yeah. like cryogenically frozen right, right now same. yeah right it just came out like a week ago or something like that yeah um all these people who are waiting to be revived one day uh, who are just cryogenically frozen in like a near death state like it's so wild our technology right and um, just waiting waiting to be unthawed one or defawed one day roughly right uh so the placenta uh if women consume things that are unhealthy for the baby they go directly to the baby what are some things that you've heard of that you're not, not supposed to eat or consume or take or whatever when you're you're pregnant yeah for sushi sushi yeah so any kind of raw fish has too much uh mercury in the body can't break it down, and so the mercury can build up and be dangerous for the baby. Interesting. Any kind of raw fish, sushi, um, and certain even certain types of cooked fish. What other stuff are you not are you not supposed to eat or consume or or use? Yeah, alcohol is a big one, right? Fetal alcohol syndrome really dangerous. It can uh, cause a lot of birth defects. Yeah, is wheat 
Yeah, any kind of drug, right? So any kind of drug that you take will go directly to the baby. And so sometimes babies are born with like addiction issues already if the mother is abusing uh, drugs during pregnancy. Even things like antidepressants and prescribed medication would go directly to the fetus. So um, most women, when they're pregnant, they avoid drinking or smoking or any kind of medication. Um, all those things would go directly to to that baby. Yeah. Even caffeine. Caffeine's a gray area. So caffeine, you're encouraged to have a um, minimal amount. So it's thought that if you have too much caffeine, then you can have like a very hyperactive baby, like a baby that has a uh, sense of high sensitivity to like things like ADHD um, and like overactivity. But caffeine isn't like a strong no. It's just a, you know, try and um, try and keep it minimal is what they tend to say. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of types of fruit and like turkey and like deli meats that uh, aren't, aren't encouraged either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the beginning. So the first three months that baby is being uh, nourished by like its own private sack. Uh, after that, you really shouldn't. Um, any alcohol would go directly to that baby. Now, one glass isn't going to be as harmful as somebody who's drinking a lot but it still could lead to complications. So it's some, probably something after three months, you don't wanna be um, consuming any of that kind of stuff, if you can help it. Uh, people can have miscarriages, that happens, right? A spontaneous abortion, they're called, or a miscarriage is when uh, pregnancy you know, becomes terminated. As I said, this is the first, uh, the first trimester is when this is most likely to happen because all of the systems are kind of developing and in place. But this can happen all the way up until birth. My uh, my sister-in-law, so my partner's sister, uh, had a miscarriage the day before her scheduled C-section. So literally at like 39 weeks, the day before, the next morning she was supposed to have her son uh, taken out by C-section. He was 13 pounds, huge baby, right? She has lots of, all her babies were big, like 12 pounds, 11 pounds, 13 pounds. The umbilical cord got wrapped around his neck and choked him. Um, and unfortunately, things like that can happen. Um, and so she still had to go through and have a C-section and have the baby removed. That happened literally the day before. That's not very common, but it can obviously happen. Uh, and so what we typically see is this is in the first trimester, but it can happen all the way up until all the way up until birth or even during birth, right? Having like a stillbirth isn't very common anymore because people are monitored so closely, uh, but it definitely can can happen. Uh, Preeclampsia is another very common condition. As women get close to childbirth, their blood pressure goes through the roof, right? A lot of tax on their body. And so their blood pressure can go up, which can be very dangerous to that woman and also to um, the baby, which might prompt something like a C-section um, early or to induce labor a little bit early. Uh, when we're monitoring through pregnancy, we usually use ultrasounds. Ultrasounds or sonograms, as they're sometimes called. Uh, are like a very non-invasive test where you use sound waves to get a visual image of a baby, right? And this is typically something that you do all the way from the beginning, um, all the way up until childbirth to see positioning, to see growth. They look like this for the most part, right? And you can see like, here's the baby's head and the, the body and you can see the little hand. It's, it's done in this way, right? Where there's a little like machine that goes over the woman's stomach. They use a bunch of gel to help it like um, have better conduct conduction. Uh, but you see images like this. You can also have 3D ultrasounds done uh, or 4D ones where you can see the baby in a kind of slightly different, uh, more in-depth way. But these are typically done very, very early. We're screening and watching the baby very closely. There's also a lot of genetic screening options that you can do. Um, and after the age of 35, women are typically really strongly encouraged to do these. Now, a lot of people do them anyway, right? Things like amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling, or this new one down here, maternal serum alpha fetal protein screening. Uh, there's a whole bunch of these different methods where they're looking to see if your baby might have a vulnerability to like a genetic disorder. So is your baby going to be vulnerable to something like Down syndrome or cerebral palsy or some kind of genetic defect? The difficulty with these is they're not always accurate, right? And so some of them are a little more invasive, like amniocentesis. I don't know if you can see it, but there's this massive needle. They go in through the stomach 
remove some of the, the fluid that's surrounding the baby and then you can test it. Or you can go through and remove a little sliver of tissue from the placenta. There's all these different ways of doing this. Some of them are just blood tests and they're getting better, but they're far from perfect. And so just something interesting to think about, would you want to do this or not? You know, and what would it maybe change or not change for you depending on the, the results? Did you have a... Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very strange sensation. Yeah. It's like very so you're just very just hot mm -hmm. and the one I that do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a big needle. It's an intimidating to look at. Uh we didn't do any of these because we didn't, it wasn't gonna change anything for us. Like we tried so hard to get pregnant, we were like, whatever we have, whatever we have, we will, we will work with, right? Um but a lot of people do these procedures because they want to know. And the advantage to an amnio is that, or an amniocentesis procedure, is it will definitely tell you the sex of the baby, like without um, any doubt. Because sometimes through ultrasound, it can be hard to tell. Uh, I think I was telling you before, my daughter was super modest, like she was always tucked up so we could never see what she was going to be on an ultrasound. Um, you would know for sure if you did one of these tests. Um, and they also give you kind of a range of outcomes of how likely or unlikely your child might be to have um, some kind of genetic defect. And then that could shape your decision to potentially um, abort that child if um, you know they're gonna have complications or it's gonna lead to complications for that woman. Uh, so it leads to a lot of conversations, but again, they're far from perfect, right? They're, they definitely are not always accurate so that that can make it very complicated. Any, um, other thoughts or comments? Anything? Anything here? Yeah. You know, the doctor who said, like, suggested my problems. My brother was like a really big baby. Okay. And they thought that he might have like diabetes because he was like such a huge child, mm -hmm. you know, twelve or thirteen pounds. Of yeah. Weight. And so they were like, "You're," and they said it to her like two times. Mm -hmm. like, Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause that's a big baby. Most babies on average are around like seven, eight pounds. So I'm, my oldest is nine pounds, two ounces. And that was considered like on the larger side, 13 is a huge baby, right? That is a big, big baby. And uh, it's not uncommon. Like it happens a lot, right? Like 12, 13 pounds. But typically what it means is you have to have different procedures done to get that baby out. And they might be more at risk for certain things. If babies are really small or really big, like my daughter Paisley was five pounds. So she was super small. I was afraid to change her diaper. She was so small. Like it was just like the tiniest little like thing ever. Um, but twins can be smaller on, on average. But, but 12 is def 12, 13 is definitely on the bigger side. Yeah. Sure. I mean, they might have to go to like what's called NICU. It's the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, in order to get a little bit bigger and stronger before they can go home. It's just, uh, if they're like five, six pounds, like it's, that's not super concerning, but if they're born really early and they haven't finished developing yet, then they oftentimes have to de finish developing almost like in a little incubator kind of thing where they're kept warm, they might need oxygen. Uh, so it depends on how early, anything before 37 weeks is premature. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Early. Very early. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's definitely small. Yeah. 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 The earlier you're born, that's very small, right? But um, typically, if babies are born like anywhere after like 30 weeks or so, they're typically fine. Um, and oftentimes what it involves, like I said, is a lot of like that baby would be, you probably, you and your sister were probably both in the hospital for some time. Yeah. Uh, before. Uh, yeah. And, so, and that's a good amount of time. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. So you add that complication yeah. as well. And, and it's silly to think it's a complication, but the older you get, the more um, likely you are to have complications in pregnancy. And so uh, typically with all of the resources we have, babies are fine even when they're born that, that, um, that early. Before 30 weeks, 
the, the risk of complications goes up exponentially, of like long-term complications because things haven't finished developing yet. Um, and sometimes that can happen outside of the body and sometimes it doesn't and it, it can lead to long-term health problems. Um, thankfully, it sounds like you both were fine. <laughs> Um, I've known people who gave birth at like 34 weeks. The kids are totally fine. Um, but before 30, the risk goes up. I, I think the earliest 22 weeks, I want to say, is the um, the earliest that a baby was born and survived. Um, it's like 22, 23 weeks. Um, and it's just it's very risky. Yeah. No one found it. So small. So small. Yeah. Um. Is that 30 thing, is it because of the egg quality? Yeah. And not necessarily, except for yeah. like you can be older and still be a surrogate. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's the eggs. It's um, that your eggs at that point um, are older. Yeah. And so the egg quality is less, which means you're more vulnerable to genetic, yeah. to genetic like, um, you know, issues. So yeah, it, it's, it's the egg it, it's, yeah. it's related to eggs. So and even if a woman like had eggs removed at 30, and they didn't get pregnant until 35, they would still flag them as like high risk, uh, but it's it's typically related to the egg quality. Yeah. Yeah, so it's risky really young and really old, right? Yeah, well, so it's a little different. It's more the body, that the body isn't fully developed yet. Um, and oftentimes people who are younger don't have as much access to like medical care. Uh, that might not always be the case. Like if you have a family that's aware and supportive, you would probably have great care. Uh, but oftentimes teenagers will hide or be unaware of pregnancies. And so the risks tend to be higher and the body is immature, right? Um, often just barely going through puberty. Um, and so that can cause complications too. Was there another hand over here? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Look it up, right? That's, no, you should look it up for me. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I, I haven't heard that. I lived in Colorado for a year. I mean, it gave me sinus problems, right? <laughs> because of the altitude. It's hard to breathe, but um, I don't know if there's a correlation with size. That's that's interesting. I've never heard that, but I mean, Colorado is very, it's very up there. That's for sure. That's funny. I've never heard that before. All right. Uh, preparing for childbirth. So as you get ready and get closer and closer to having your baby or babies, um, a lot of women and couples will go through prepared childbirth classes, right? They'll take a class together. I did this. It was a lot of fun. We got to learn how to change diapers. I got to carry a little baby around that I named like Jean Philippe. I don't know why I named him Jean Philippe, but I named him that and carried him around for like three months. Uh, we got to change diapers. You learn breathing techniques. You learn all these things. Um, your options for labor. Oftentimes people go into labor not knowing what to expect. You take a class like this. You learn how to breathe. You learn what your pain management options are. People sometimes make friendships in these classes as well. Um, you know, because it's everybody who's pregnant at a similar time. You have a great resource there. And you might even see these people again in labor um, down the line. But very common to take these classes. Lamaze is a, like the traditional one where you learn breathing techniques. But um, in general, there's a bunch of these where, like, where they're teaching you just like what to do after you have a baby and what to do during um, labor and delivery. Because a lot of people don't know that you do have quite a few options for how you're going to manage having that baby, right, or babies. And it's not uncommon for people to hire a midwife or a doula. Midwives and doulas are kind of like an intermediary between the doctor and the parents. Um, and so um, they might be there to help you with kind of managing childbirth or breathing or just be a source of uh, comfort or, or knowledge. Uh, but it's something that a lot of people will consider hiring. Some uh, hospitals actually have them on staff, um, but it's typically someone that you would have to hire ahead of time. But these childbirth classes are going to teach you a lot of different things, uh, especially things like breathing during labor. Breathing can be a big um, help with managing pain and also with distraction. Um, I always think of baby mama with the birthing classes. I showed you that clip from baby mama last time, but I have uh, two really short ones from that that I'll, I'll play for you. With birth, right, um, options for delivery and pain management and so on. Uh, you saw her like bouncing on that um, on the big exercise ball. That's actually very common during labor. Um, it helps the baby come down like the vaginal canal, right? So that's something that you might talk about as well. Um, 
And she's talking about tearing, right? Not to uh, talk about that too much, but if you remember when we talked about female anatomy, that thin stretch of skin between the vaginal opening and the anal opening is called the perineum. And that perineum can tear during childbirth. If you think about the size of a baby um, coming out of the vaginal, canals sometimes that can happen so massaging um, that area can sometimes help with that to prevent tearing that's something that's typically monitored much more by doctors but they talked about it a little bit in there as well but um classes like that can be really helpful a lot of couples do them most insurance and like hospitals and places do offer them and they're typically free because they want to encourage you um you know to have that knowledge and they'll also talk about things like breastfeeding versus bottle feeding and, and all sorts of things like that as well was that a thought you put your hand up? Uh, so when it comes to childbirth, uh, there's there's kind of a, a rule. Let me find my little pen here. Uh, when people start to go into labor, you start having contractions. Now there's something called Braxton Hicks contractions. They're like practice contractions, if you will. Very common for women as they get closer to the end of pregnancy to have what are called Braxton Hicks contractions. It's just a tightening and a little bit of pain in the uterus, but they're not actually in labor. Labor can be quite painful. It can last quite a, quite a few hours on average, like 16 to 18 hours for the first baby. It's much faster usually for um, babies after that. Um, but what happens is your uterus is starting to change. It's starting to contract. Everything's starting to open up to make room for that baby to come out. So the rule when it comes to labor, it's called the 511 rule. So when a woman is having contractions that are five minutes apart, contractions are five minutes apart, right? That's the five, right? Lasting for one minute, And so five minutes apart, lasting for one minute for an hour. When you have that happening, right? five minutes apart for one minute for an hour, you need to go to the hospital, you're in active labor. Or if your water breaks. If your water breaks, which is always the stereotype in films that actually doesn't always happen during labor, um, or at least early parts of labor, it might happen during childbirth itself. But if a woman's water breaks, they have 24 hours to get that baby out. The baby no longer has enough um, like fluid around them to survive on their own. So you have to remove that baby um, or they won't have oxygen. So either if their water breaks or they're having contractions that are five minutes apart for one minute for an hour. At that point, you need to go to the hospital. You are in active labor. If you want to know my partner, I like if I can sum my partner up in one story, this I think like sums her up. She went into active labor with our firstborn, and she made us clean the house while she was in active labor. She was literally in labor, screaming, vacuuming and cleaning the house. I'm like, what are you doing? We're going to the hospital now. She's like, I don't want to come home to a dirty house, right? That is my partner to a T, like in the middle of labor, cleaning the house, right? I always like to tell that story because it just sums her up. Um, but when you have this point, you got to go, right? That baby is coming. Um, it might not be immediately, but that baby is on its way. Typically, we talk about um, labor being in three stages. So three stages of childbirth. The first stage um, is when you have are starting to have these contractions. They're regular. The cervix is starting to dilate. So remember, the cervix is that long area kind of between the vaginal canal um, and the uterus. And so what happens during pregnancy is it closes. It closes to keep all of that fluid in and protect the baby. What happens is the cervix then starts to open up a little bit, slowly and slowly and slowly, and it opens up enough, all of that fluid comes out. And that's why a woman's water will break, or bag of water, as they typically call it. Um, so in this first stage, we have like 10 to 16 hours of um, labor, right? On average, it can be longer, it can be shorter, but women are having active contractions, which hurts. They're, they're painful, right? You can hear um, people screaming. It's kind of disturbing. You're in the childbirth unit. Everyone's screaming all around you a little bit, uh, but you can get these contractions for like 10 to 16 hours. Usually it's like four hours for like second and third born um, child. 
Cervical effacement and dilation. So the cervix is effacing and dilating, which means it's stretching and thinning out in preparation for childbirth. So it's starting to open up. And oftentimes doctors will come in and check, but you're at one, um, you know, one centimeter, two centimeters, eight centimeters, you're fully dilated, right? Which means that um, you're all the way open. I have this uh, picture. So one centimeter is a Cheerio. Lifesaver. Here we go. We'll just go through them all. Right. So by the time you are fully dilated, you're the size of um, opened up to the size of a bagel, right? Um, an Oreo at five centimeters, right? But um, oftentimes when we talk about dilation, right, that cervix, which starts out closed, opens and opens and opens, even at the size of a bagel, right? That's still way smaller than a baby's head. So that's why a woman has to actively push that baby out. Um, and the vaginal canal does stretch and expand. Uh, but just to give you perspective when they're talking about one centimeter versus two versus three and, and so on. Some food comparisons. We had to go with food, obviously, right? So I'll go back here, but um, just for perspective. But the cervix, it faces, it dilates, it opens up. When a woman is fully dilated, so all the way at 10 centimeters, their cervix is as open as it's going to be. Then they go into the second stage of labor, which is uh, kind of active labor. This is when the woman is pushing the baby out. Okay, and so every time they have a contraction, they push and then they rest. And when they have another contraction, they push and then they rest. And this typically is like 30 minutes to two hours, depending on the woman, depending on the baby and how many babies they've had. But this is when the woman is actively pushing the baby out of them. Crowning, if you've ever heard that term, is when you can see the baby's head, when the baby's head is starting to come out. Um, if, you, if the doctor says the baby is crowning, that's what that means, that the baby's head is right there about to come out. That would be like in that last picture right there. Uh, but at this stage, again, this is where people are pushing. And typically, um, after a half hour to two hours, like they'll push that baby out and have a vaginal birth. Now, if there are complications or the baby doesn't continue through the vaginal canal, then we might have to explore other options like a C-section um, and so on. So there are things that can happen at this stage. If a baby isn't coming out, then we might have to consider a C-section. And my, my poor partner, she uh, we had, she went to the hospital because she had preeclampsia. She had really high blood pressure. They induced labor. So they gave her medication to induce labor. Um, and even though I knew I had like two days, I didn't sleep for those two days that she was like in induced labor. And so I started out, childbirth like with a very with no sleep which is a bad spot to be in um, and then she pushed for two hours the baby didn't come out and so we had to have a c-section we kind of got like a little bit of everything <laughs> on that first one uh, but it's very common that women might have problems here and then require a little bit of help like a like a c-section to get that baby out uh, the third stage is when you deliver the placenta or the afterbirth as it's typically called. So after the baby is born, there's actually one last push, um, one last like push to get the afterbirth and the placenta and everything out. Um, but this whole process altogether, you know, on average, like 16 to 20 hours for a firstborn, um, and then quite a bit quicker for, for subsequent uh, children. Any um, stories or questions or thoughts or anything here, anything related to this? Um, one other thing you might hear a lot, uh, an epidural. Sometimes women, when they're in this process of childbirth, um, they talked about a natural birth. A natural birth would be if you don't take any medication, right? So you manage the pain on your own through breathing or through, you know, distraction, whatever it might be. Very common for women to get what's called an epidural. They give you an injection in your back, which blocks the pain right, from typically from your waist down. The downside to an epidural, well, so the upside obviously is that you have less pain. The downside is if you are blocking the pain, what happens is women can no longer walk while they have the epidural, so they can no longer push. So what typically happens is when you have an epidural, it drastically increases your chances of a C-section. So epidurals come with some risks associated with them. You can also have pain medication given to you um, that doesn't necessarily go to the baby, depending on what they give you, um, to manage the pain. So there's all sorts of different things that you can explore, which you would talk about in those uh, childbirth classes. Hey, we had that already. Right. Um, I have a clip for you, but I don't know if we, I think we have enough time for it. So I'll play this clip for you. Um, the same movie, the, uh, 
what to expect when expecting to actually it's like 18 I, i'll maybe i'll play it for you next time i'll just keep talking and then we'll play it uh i don't want to like go over on accident and uh, be respectful of your time but uh as i said typically people will have a uh like a vaginal birth if that doesn't go well, or if the baby's too big, or if the baby is breech, if you've ever heard that, the baby is breech, which means that their feet are down instead of their head, okay? So if a baby's feet are pointed toward the vaginal canal, they can't be delivered that way. The head has to come out first. Um, and so if that's the case, or the baby's too big, or there's more than one baby, you might have to consider what's called a C-section or a cesarean section. And this is what they do is they go through and they um, make make a large incision through the stomach, through the abdomen, and then through the uterine wall, and they remove the baby manually from the stomach. Now, this is quite a procedure, but it's very common. A lot of women have C-sections, and uh, typically the partner can be in there for that. They make you put on like, uh, you know, like the little scrubs and everything, and then you get to go in there and be part of it, uh, or watch it, I guess not part of it. But um, this is something Right. No, thank you. Uh, but this is something that is relatively commonly done, especially if there are twins or if the baby's big. Uh, and oftentimes, if a woman has a C-section the first time, they'll typically have a C-section the next time as well. They don't have to, but it's relatively common if you've had one that your next baby would be delivered that way as well. And um, again, this is quite a procedure. I wasn't, they don't really give you a lot of information about this, but I walked in and like, there's a whole team for the mom and then there's a whole team for the baby. Or if you have more than one baby, there's three teams, which is a little overwhelming. Um, but they go in and like I said, they remove the baby. There's so much blood. I wasn't prepared for that. My partner half in her half like drug induced state was like, if you pass out, I'll kill you. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to pass out. You're getting cut. If I passed out, I would be like awful. But people do sometimes pass out as part of these procedures, like partners, I mean, um, which can lead to lots of discord later on. But they remove the baby and then they sew the, the woman back up and they can typically hold that baby right away. While they're attending to her, there's also people attending to the baby right after they're born as well. So um, it's quite an intense procedure, but again, relatively common. It, it happens a lot, especially if there are any complications. A couple of alternate options, water births and hypnobirthing. Water births are really growing in popularity right now. The idea is that um, a baby is developing in utero in like fluid. And so if they're born into fluid, that, that it's less of a harsh transition for that baby. So they're born, it looks like this. It's almost like a, a fancy hot tub in a way, right? Um, but the, everything is very sterile. Obviously, this is not something you would do at home in a regular hot tub. This is a very specific environment. But the baby comes out into water. And so it's thought to be less um, of a harsh transition for that baby. Um, hypnobirthing is when you practice breathing and hypnosis instead of medication. And that's also something that is um, relatively popular right now. But by far, vaginal birth or C-sections um, are the most are the most common. Yeah. Oh, no, you can. Uh, but I just mean because you're um, it's a surgery. So typically what they will do is they'll bring the baby up to you and like put them next to your face um, because it's traditionally encouraged the second you give birth to put that baby on your skin to help regulate them. But um, the woman is under like sedation um, and typically been um, like numb from the waist down. And so uh, because she can't get up and move, the, they will bring the baby over. Again, it's a it's it's intense, right? Especially with twins, right? Because they pulled one out and then they pulled another one out. There's crying everywhere. I was like, everyone's crying. <laughs> Me too. Right. Um, but it can be it can be intense. My poor partner on the second one, her epidural failed and she felt everything. I wanted to kill the anesthesiologist. I've never wanted to kill someone so badly in my whole life. Um, like she was like screaming and passed out and it was it terrified me. She's a tough tough, tough person. If that had been me, I would have died. <laughs> like, I'm not tough at all, right? Yeah. Yeah, her C-section, they gave her an epidural and it failed. And so she literally felt everything and they couldn't do anything about it at that point. Um, and so she had a massive surgery, uh, screaming, threw up, she passed out. It was, it was awful. Yeah, I was free. I, oh my God, I wanted to hit this guy so bad. I'm like, your turn, right? Like, I was so mad at this guy. Um, and he's like, I'm doing everything I can, but there's nothing I can do at this point. Uh, 
that unfortunately can happen. It's not super common, but it, it can. Happen. Was there another? Hint? Yeah. Yep. And when they pulled the baby out, um, and and everything. Yeah, it was. It was super traumatic. And like afterwards, she's all like, she didn't care afterward because we had two healthy babies. But in that moment, it was it was pretty terrifying. Yeah, that's not common, not to scare you. Like that's not that's not common, but it um it did definitely happen for her, unfortunately. Other uh thoughts or comments, stories, questions? Anyone else? Anything else here? So after childbirth, so we call it uh prenatal when the baby's in still in the uterus in the womb. Postpartum is afterward. So postpartum is the several weeks after childbirth. There's a lot of adjustment going on at this time. You know, obviously you have been carrying a baby and so you have all these hormones going through your system. When you remove that baby, the hormones, um, they crash. And so you were talking about postpartum um, depression earlier. Postpartum depression is actually very, very common. It's called the baby, uh, baby blues a little bit is like the most common thing. Very typical for women to have hormones that fall through the floor. The second they give birth and there's nothing in them anymore, there's almost like a sense of loss that can come with that for some. Uh, and so as their hormone levels bottom out, very common for women to cry um, and be very, very emotional and struggle with depression. Now, some of that is normal, but postpartum psychosis or postpartum like depression itself. So the baby blues are normal. But postpartum depression or psychosis, where you have thoughts of hurting the baby or hurting yourself, um, is not very common. Um, Andrea Yates, if you ever heard of Andrea Yates, she drowned her five children in the bathtub um, and killed all five of her kids um, with postpartum depression and psychosis. She thought that God was telling her to do so um, and that they were not going to turn out right. And so she killed each one of them in succession. Um, really like famous case of um, insanity. Um, she had intense postpartum psychosis. Sometimes people will hallucinate their hormone levels are so out of balance. What is typical though, is just, you know, being sad or being emotional. Uh, we had a friend who went through pregnancy at the same time as us. She cried for like three hours because she couldn't find a sock. I mean, it's like stuff like that, like something small, you know, caused her to just cry. Your hormones are just completely out of whack. Um, and that is really normal postpartum depression or psychosis. Um, not so much. Uh, breastfeeding and bottle feeding, this is something you have to decide relatively quickly. Uh, most places will encourage you to breastfeed, right? Saying that breastfeeding is the best option um, for a baby. There are, are a lot of advantages to breastfeeding, but there also are a lot of advantages to bottle feeding as well. And so it's pretty common um, that people will do a combination of the two. So breastfeeding, um, one of the biggest advantages to breastfeeding is that it's free right? It doesn't cost you anything. Formula is ridiculously expensive. And this year, like toward the beginning of this year, there was a massive formula shortage. And a lot of people were really struggling with that. The cost of formula went through the roof. Um, so like a little canister of formula can be like 20 bucks. And that only lasts maybe, you know, four to five days if you're lucky, right? So it's, it's very expensive to uh, formula feed. So breastfeeding is obviously free, which is a huge advantage. It has a lot of um, immune system boosting like elements to it. You are passing your immunity through your breast milk to your baby. And so oftentimes it's very strongly encouraged to do this. Um, there is a substance, um, they call it liquid gold, which makes me think of like, what's his name? Austin Powers or whatever, like liquid gold, uh, but it's called colostrum. What was that? I thought it was like, like the first time. Like right after birth. Yeah, this is like the first, um, like, so those first few days of breastfeeding is um, you, the baby gets what's called colostrum. It's the most concentrated of the breast milk because after that it gets diluted quite a bit. But this, um, this colostrum contains all of the antibodies and proteins and things that help balance out this baby. It can um, boost their immune system. It reduces the risk for SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, which is something that can happen and is really unexplained. Uh, there are a lot of health advantages to breastfeeding and that colostrum, if you do nothing else, the hospitals usually recommend that you at least breastfeed for like two to three days if you're not gonna continue 
so that your baby gets that colostrum or, or liquid gold. That first um, little bit of breast milk is the most concentrated and the best for, for that baby. So like one to three days of that. Uh, but typically people will breastfeed for like a good year. The American Pediatric Association recommends that you breastfeed for a year minimum. Um, but it's not uncommon for people to also use formula. Breastfeeding is time consuming, right? So that's a disadvantage. It also can be very painful. Babies don't have teeth, okay? But it's still, they're very powerful with their sucking. This can be a painful thing. Babies sometimes don't latch on, which can make it difficult. So um, there are disadvantages and a partner can't typically help with breastfeeding because um, only that like mother could do that. So oftentimes what people will do is they will breastfeed and then they might pump, right? So you can purchase um, a pump that you attach to your breast and it like simulates uh, breastfeeding and you can actually pump out breast milk that you could feed in a bottle. So a partner could help. Or you might use some formula and some breast milk at the same time, where you can kind of mix them a little bit. Sometimes women don't produce enough breast milk, right? And so they might need to go to formula um, as well. So um, there's a lot of like delicate balance here and a lot of shaming that women go through um, of like, you need to breastfeed when some women unfortunately just aren't able to do so. Um, it's pretty uncommon, but it can happen or they just run into issues and have to supplement uh, with formula. Uh, sex can resume after birth. They typically try um, and tell you to wait. I think it's like six weeks or so after birth, everything to like heal the uterus to reset to its normal position. Uh, so three to four weeks is like the minimum, but they try and encourage right around six weeks. Um, oftentimes this is a period of incredible adjustment, right? You have a newborn baby and so people aren't sleeping. You know, babies are very taxing. They sleep 20 hours a day, but only like 20 minutes at a time. So it's not like you're getting continuous sleep. So uh, um, it's really as soon as like, um, you know, that woman who gave birth is healed and ready. Um, but typically we encourage like about six weeks, a minimum of like three to four um, and in order to like resume any kind of sexual activity. And I said, I have a, um, like I said earlier, I have a, um, like a 20 minute clip that I want to play for. It's like 18 minutes. So what I'll do is on Wednesday, we will have um, the guest speakers. So we're going to move on to chapter 15 and we'll talk about STIs. And then when I see you the next class, we'll kind of wrap up the last thoughts with this and I'll play that clip for you. Um, and then I have kind of a fun STI activity that we'll do um, as well. So on Wednesday, I'll make sure those slides are posted, but we will move on to 15 and then we'll kind of come back and wrap this up, um, wrap this up afterwards. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there for today. Um, don't forget to start thinking about that second homework assignment, like I mentioned earlier. And then um, I will see you all Wednesday morning. Enjoy the rain, cold, rainy weather. <laughs>